around this time last year, I was talking to my friend and we were throwing around some crazy ideas. And we were talking about the recent trend of college hackathons. And he blurted, wouldn't it be awesome to have a hackathon at the White House? We thought about the idea a little bit and then got back to our homework. I'm a computer scientist by training, but as someone who has been in school for the majority of my life, I've spent a good amount of time reflecting on my own education. For a long time, technology and education have been seen as separate disciplines. But as technology is increasingly incorporated into every area of our lives, so too does education increasingly incorporate technology. In the spirit of getting teaching and learning into the digital era, we've tried many things to make education more digital. 2012 was the year of the massive open online course and promises to make teaching faster, cheaper, and better scale to students everywhere. The result, teachers recording lectures in the same way they would give them in a classroom, putting them online, resulting in completion rates of about 15%. In 2013, the LA Unified School District planned to spend $1.3 billion on iPads only to turn around on cold feet after realizing that the software and the infrastructure weren't what they thought they'd signed up for. But despite these failures of technology and education, there have also been many instances of technology having a significant positive impact. Students from all over the US are using the internet for research. Uh, they're making video projects in their classes. Uh, they're using computers for computer science. And Albemarle County School Districts in Charlottesville, Virginia is one example among many pockets of primary and secondary schools that have received national acclaim for their makerspaces, allowing their students to creatively express their learning um, through these new tools. And through the Connect Ed initiative of the Obama administration, more schools are providing internet access to their, school, to their students than ever before allowing their students to familiarize themselves with the digital tools that are ubiquitous today. But as the test scores of our nation fall far behind those of China, Singapore, Japan, Korea, Japan, Finland, people are justified in pointing out that our efforts with education technology have not given us the results that the technology has promised. Technology was supposed to improve education by making it higher quality, more accessible, and more affordable. And what we've seen is that while technology has improved education for some, it has failed to achieve the mass success that the technology has promised. What happened? Wasn't technology supposed to come in as the grand superhero and solve all our problems? As a Silicon Valley native, I wondered, what would it take for technology to disrupt education? Pondering that point led me on a journey far outside the walls of our technology sector. Uh, I wanted to learn as much as I could about our education system. So remember that conversation we had at the beginning about a hackathon at the White House? Well, in September of 2015, my friend became an intern at the White House, and I started interning at the US Department of Education. I couldn't believe it. But that was only the beginning. How would two interns convince senior White House staff to let us host such an event? Interns don't just come in and tell people what to do. And the prospect of hosting a hackathon, a type of event rather foreign to public officials, was also no easy task. And guess what? The White House doesn't even have Wi-Fi. Seriously. So after pitching our idea around only to have it sit on the desks of senior White House staff, we came up with a better idea. What if we did it as a computer science tech jam as a part of Computer Science Education Week? On December 7th, 2015, we welcomed students, teachers, and developers into the White House for the Computer Science Tech Jam. Participants had a simple goal to build something that would help address early STEM biases in preschool through fifth grade that keep women and minorities out of computer science. We, uh, participants included people from companies like Google, Minecraft, Glass Lab Game, Spiro, Magic Leap, as well as students from local high schools and colleges and teachers from all over the United States. Here's a picture of the Magic Leap team uh, talking about their idea with with some teachers. And here is another picture of a, another project that was a little game for logic gates, the, the building blocks for computation. By bringing together teachers, developers, and students, all voices were critical in building things that would truly be effective for education. It was in that moment that I realized something important about education. John King, the current Secretary of Education, in his closing address at the White House Tech Jam, said the following. He said, I was also encouraged by the level of listening that was taking place. 
As you visit schools across the country, too often you see technology tools that might have made a difference in theory, but aren't actually working for kids in the classroom. It was in the dialogue between students, developers, and teachers that became powerful ideas for education. When we are willing to come to the table to un listen and understand, we're able to personally invest ourselves in a mission that isn't just about us, but about fundamentally adding value to the people we are serving. But what does this have to do with technology? Well, the legend of Silicon Valley, Steve Jobs himself, himself said the following. He said, I used to think that technology could help education. I've probably spearheaded giving away more computers to schools than anybody else on the planet. But I've come to the inevitable conclusion that what's wrong with our education system cannot be fixed with technology. No amount of technology will make a dent. The three months I spent at the US Department of Education gave me, an, gave me a bigger picture of the incredibly diverse set of issues that our nation's education system faces that is unique to our own country. Not only do we have students from every racial and ethnic background, we also have to deal with different languages, different social norms, and expectations. Steve Jobs was right given his assumption of education, but I find that his assumption was fundamentally flawed. You don't simply give a student an iPad and have their grammar improve. It doesn't work that way. Contrary to the ethos of Silicon Valley, education can't be disrupted with a single solution. With so many diverse stakeholders and such complicated dynamics, implementing technology and education isn't about tech companies developing and pushing their own ideas, but about starting with conversations with everyone involved. Students, teachers, developers, parents, administration, and more. It's about implementing technology only when it is the best tool for the job. Too often we fail to consider how our decisions impact students of lower socioeconomic statuses, minorities, and other marginalized students. Arnie Duncan, the former Secretary of Education, framed it in the context of technological access. He said, I worry that technology is not being implemented fast enough. Technology has the ability to improve equity in our public schools or the ability to exacerbate current equity gaps. Pondering these two perspectives led me to my next question. Given that we can't make any assumptions about what students need, what are the problems that all students, especially disenfranchised students, struggle with on a regular basis? To answer this question, I turn to the tools I know best, web programming. But this time, instead of seeing technology as a tool for teaching and learning, I saw it a little bit differently. I saw it as a tool for civic engagement and empowerment. With a student-run nonprofit named Student Voice, we came together and put together a collection of 12 rights ranging from everything from free, uh, free expression to fair assessment to safety and well-being and more. And we paired these 12 rights with a digital voting, allowing students from all over the US to vote on the top three that matter the most to them. Here's what we found. Out of 1,000 students that voted on the Student Bill of Rights, the top three rights were free expression, fair assessment, and personal learning. Now, what do all three of those have in common? Well, what all three of those have in common is an emphasis on the student. Students want to be heard. They want education to be valuable to them. And unfortunately, our recent trend through initiatives like No Child Left Behind and Common Core have pushed in the opposite direction, inherently detracting from a student's personal agency. And many of the technology tools that we push have not been much better. They've been nothing more than putting videos on YouTube, putting uh, worksheets on a screen, and exams in a digital format. Maybe the first responsibility of our education system is to listen to our students. To make the quantitative qualitative, we paired the digital voting with a national tour, visiting schools all over the US. We took the step to meet with students, listen to their stories, and share them online. Here are a couple of them. One student in South Carolina spoke about the lack of student choice in their school fund. He said, our field trip account is zero. Our activities account is zero. We keep getting told that all of our money is in a general fund and can't be used for things like textbooks or paper. This general fund sounds great, some crazy, mysterious place. How can I get some of this general fund? This next story comes from a refugee student who is part of a group at their school uh, with students from similar backgrounds. And this story t taught me the importance 
of students feeling safe and willing, able to express themselves before feeling comfortable in their classroom. She said, after my dad died, I was so depressed. I could never go anywhere. I could never leave the house. I could never talk to anyone. But when my mom said, let's go on vacation, I was feeling like, sure. So we went, but when I saw the border, I was like, wait, where are we? My mom told me we were going to the US, and I was like, wait, you never told me anything. You never told me this. I started crying more and more and more and more. I hated my mom for those 15 days because she never really told me what was going to happen, but happy at the same time because if she would have told me, I never would have come with her. The happiest thing was when I got here and I got to meet my uncles and my grandpa. Those people were never in my life before, but really helped me out a lot. It is stories like this that we've collected and shared through our online platform. And if you want to see more stories like this, check out the Student Voice Facebook page. But hopefully by getting a small glimpse of what these students go through on a regular basis, you've come to a similar conclusion that I did. Maybe we've been looking at education technology wrong this whole time. Technology shouldn't be a sterile programmatic medium for students to standardize their learning. Instead, it should be a tool that allows students to express their creativity and emotions in a safe way. I don't see education as deterministic computation. I see it as a beautiful mess of emotions, problems, and community. Students are people full of ideas, emotions, problems, character, nuance, culture, ambitions, and thoughts. Students spill out in ways that don't fit into conventional boundaries. Just look at student organized movements like the Vietnam War protests, demonstrations against genocides overseas, civil rights, and Black Lives Matter. Students have always been at the forefront of being the change they want to see in the world. Now, I'm not saying that protests are the only way to improve education, but we do need to be heard. Education isn't the responsibility of the government, nor is it the responsibility of the teacher. It is the responsibility of the whole community, students, teachers, parents, and administration, dialoguing about the things that we can do in our schools, our country, and our world. The ways that students have organized looks vastly different from generation to generation. And as our generation sets the example for what it means to bring equity and equality in a digital era, I hope that you are as proud as I am of being a student going to school in America today. As students, we are all inadvertently part of a dialogue that transcends our own education system, whether we are aware of it or not. It is through this dialogue that we have the choice to empower or silence the voices of the students around us. It may be hard to believe that your voice matters in the big picture of education, but that's what I thought before organizing the White House Tech Jam. Education has a long way to go before reaching the goals of quality, equity, affordability, and accessibility, and whether we achieve those goals through technology or otherwise, it starts with students like us participating in this dialogue. How will you participate in this dialogue? I'm gonna leave you with a confession. I started this journey thinking it was about the technology. But it's not about the technology. It's about the students. Thank you.